All right, good morning, happy Easter, good to see you guys, so glad you're with us today. If you're joining us on the live stream, we're glad that you're with us. We consider you as much a part of our church family as if you were here in the sanctuary with us. And you guys outside, good to see you. I, I, I told the staff, I said, I'm going to call that the amphitheater, so everybody on, on the internet thinks we're, it's really impressive, but it's not. It's just chairs outside beyond the roll-up door. But, you know, it's still fun to think, right? All right, we're going to pray and then start worship. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your kindness and your goodness towards us this week. We've not gone hungry. We've not gone naked. We've had a place to sleep. And, and Lord, we're surrounded by friends and family, and we just thank you so much for that. On this Easter Sunday morning, as we celebrate the resurrection of Christ, we thank you and we're so grateful for what he has done on our behalf that we might have life eternal. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, if you'll say hello to somebody next to you, we'll get started with worship. Please stand.
built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I did not trust the sweetest friend.
Your loving kindness has welcomed me. Though I'm unworthy of majesty, you wrap me.
guys you may be seated you know I love the message of that lost song that that we're pursuing God and and you know one of my favorite phrases you've heard it uh, we've you know I've said it so many times long before we were thinking about God God was thinking about us and that's really what that song is about right there's a drawing through the Holy Spirit for us to pursue God and hunger for God and build a relationship with Him. And, and so I'm just so grateful this morning for our worship team. Thank you guys so much for worship today and, and leading us in that. And as we go into our teaching time, um, I just want us to really focus on the resurrection of Christ and what He's done. Uh, we're going to go ahead and do the giving talk just very briefly. I had originally decided we were just going to kind of push that to the end, but I got some amazing pictures today I want to share with you. You know, we have a lot of work over in Africa that we do, and they're seven hours ahead of us. And so, you know, they've done their services. I woke up this morning and had a basket load of photos of, of things that have been going on. I'm just going to share two of them with you. Let's do the one of our deaf congregation out in Kakamega, uh, the group picture. So, uh, you know, we have a deaf ministry out in Kakamega, which is western Kenya. They gathered this morning, and, and, and we don't really call it a church yet. We call it a fellowship. Uh, one of the things that we're, we're trying to figure out is how to maintain really good theology 
um, with uh, people who we have a hard time getting through our school of ministry, right? I mean, it's uh, Boniface and Jonathan do a phenomenal job for us. Great, great, great teachers of the word. And so we're hoping that this will uh, soon emerge with a full-time pastor. Uh, we're looking for a pastor who is able to speak as well as knows African Sign Language. And so, uh, but this was them meeting this morning. And then this next picture is really exciting for me. Uh, this young man, his name is Kevin. He was attending one of our churches near Githrai, uh, outside of Nairobi. And his job moved him over to Joska, where we have River's Edge Church, Joska. And, and he was actually living kind of in the middle of these two places. And um, he's been through Bible college. He's ready to start a church. And this is what we talk about when we talk about giving God margin and allowing God to make the decisions. We just make ourselves available. Uh, it, it really wasn't convenient for him to travel to Githri. It wasn't convenient for him to travel to Joska. And so we've decided we're going to probably start a new church, a River's Edge church um, in Utawata is what it's called. Um, he started a Bible study, and this is how we normally do it. He now has 15 men in his Bible study, and they've been progressing now for a few weeks. Uh, Pastor Freddie, who helps kind of oversee all of our ministries there in East Africa, was over this past weekend with them for the Bible study on Friday. And um, he's assuring that it's grounded and it's got what it needs. But if you can imagine, Africans have very big families. And so with 15 men and their families, when we launch this church, we're hoping we'll have probably between 75 and 100 active members immediately in that church. And this would be our sixth church in East Africa, River's Edge Church. And our plans to start the church in Uganda are still on track. We're hoping to launch that sometime in the fall. And that would give us eight churches in East Africa. And so God is continuing to work. Your faithfulness is continuing to allow us to do that. And, and as you know, um, we just follow the Holy Spirit. Uh, we have a budget here at River's Edge Church, but we do ministry. And we live by faith. If God calls us to do it, we do it. You know, our phrase is we want to be a ministry-releasing, permission-giving church. If God's called you to do it, we want you to do it. And that applies here as well as all over the world where we do mission work. So let's pray and then we'll take up the offering. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that our, our people are so generous. They're obedient to the tithe. They're generous with the offering. And that allows us to do ministry here in our own community. It allows us to impact the schools. It impact, allows us to impact those around us who are the least among us, those who are hungry, who are hopeless, who are hurting. But then it also allows us to impact the world, uh, not just in Africa, but in Central Asia, in Poland, in South America, in Central America, in the Caribbean, um, everywhere that we're doing work. We thank you, Lord, that you've opened those doors. And we promise that we're going to continue to follow you wherever, wherever you lead us. In Jesus' name, amen. Now it's back on. There we go. All right. Well, good morning again. Welcome to River's Edge Church. Uh, what an amazing day the Lord's given us. A beautiful day, great weather, and just to be in the fellowship 
of other brothers and sisters in Jesus to celebrate the resurrection of Christ. Whether you're here in the sanctuary in our overthrow spaces or, or watching online, I, I want you to know this morning, and I, you know, I say it regularly, but I, I hope you believe it. God loves you. He loves you exactly for who you are, exactly where you are in life, exactly what you're going through. God has no preconditions to his love. He's created you, he has sustained you, and he loves you. Matter of fact, Romans 5, 8 tells us this, that God demonstrates his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You know, when we were lost, when we were abandoned to the things of the world, God made the sacrifice for us through Christ. Even now, in this very moment, God is demonstrating his love for you by what Christ did 2,000 years ago. What a wonderful, comforting, beautiful truth for us to embrace this morning. Let's pray as we start our teaching time. Uh, Holy Spirit, we invite you in to open our hearts and minds that, that as you speak to us, our hearts would be changed, our lives would be changed, that we would be drawn closer to you. We yield our own sense of self to you and allow you free reign in these next few moments to speak to us. In Jesus' name, amen. So you know on Easter Sunday, uh, there's something comforting when we talk about the resurrection. Uh, a message on the resurrection kind of reestablishes the hope we walk in as believers that our trusting in Jesus is not in vain, that Jesus' death was not in vain. That his burial wasn't the end of a good run of a good man who did lots of good things, but that he is the Messiah, the Savior of the world. I think Easter Sunday sermons help us look beyond the struggles of this life and embrace more deeply the promises of eternal life for those who believe in a world that's, that's constantly trying to ostracize and undermine traditional Christian faith, Easter Sunday and Christmas still seem like times when maybe our message isn't completely rejected. Although commercialized and exploited maybe, just maybe the message still gets through all of the periphery noise. Somehow, some way, maybe the message of the resurrection still makes an impact. And so what I want to do this morning is read you the Easter story. And, and we're just going to take a few verses. And then I want us to talk about it, but maybe not in the way that traditionally Easter messages are structured. Now, we're in John chapter 20. If you want to turn to John chapter 20 in your Bible or Bible on your electronic device, uh, John chapter 20 starts off like this in verse 1. Early on Sunday morning, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and found that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance. She ran and found Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved. And that's how John refers to himself in his own writing. He, he never says, oh, hey, I'm John and I was there. He says, the one whom Jesus loved. She said, they have taken the Lord's body out of the tomb and we don't know where, he's, where they've put him. Peter and the other disciple started out for the tomb. And they were both running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He stooped and looked in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he didn't go in. Then Simon Peter arrived and went inside. He also noticed the linen wrappings lying there. While the cloth that had covered Jesus' head was folded up and lying apart from the other wrappings, then the disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in, and he saw and believed. For until then, they still had not understood the scriptures that said, Jesus must rise from the dead. Twenty-seven years ago, when I was ending my time in seminary, 
uh, in religious and secular circles, you could easily be divided into one of two camps. Those who believed in the historical, physical, bodily resurrection of Jesus and those who didn't. And so let me just be clear this morning on what River's Edge Church believes. I'm just going to read to you our statement of faith that clearly communicates what we believe about Jesus and his resurrection because this is foundational for everything else I have to say today. We believe that Jesus Christ is fully God and was fully human. That he was born of a virgin. That he lived a sinless human life and offered himself as the perfect substitutionary sacrifice. Now that's a big word. It simply means that Jesus put himself in my place. He was a substitute for me when he died on the cross. He was a perfect substitutionary sacrifice for the sins of all people by dying on a cross and his lifeless body was placed in the tomb. He physically arose from the dead after three days to demonstrate his power over sin and death. He ascended to heaven's glory and ever lives to make intercession for us and will return again someday to earth to reign as King of kings and Lord of lords. That's what we believe, not just as a church, but as a Christian faith. But unlike 27 years ago, today in our postmodern, and I would even say post-Christian culture, the question of did Jesus rise from the dead really is not the defining issue like it once was. You see, in my seminary days, the argument for or against the resurrection was a scientific argument. Given what we know about science and medicine and the human body, could Jesus really have been resurrected? It was a debate between science and belief. A debate between impossibilities and faith. Uh, three decades later, that's no longer the argument when it comes to Easter and the celebration of Jesus and his resurrection. Now it's a question of why does it matter? What difference does a resurrection make to me? Uh, unfortunately, we have churches filled with people who were raised in the church and they believe that Jesus was raised from the dead. If you ask them, they would say, yes, I believe Jesus was resurrected. But what difference does it make? Why should I even care about that? Today, the assumption is not that there are scientific laws preventing the resurrection of Jesus. But there's a personal law inside of me that says... Yeah, I don't have to adapt my life and how I live to anything that I don't find personally beneficial. Or you could say it another way, uh, the truth only matters to me if I find it acceptable and helpful. I mean, is that not the world we live in? And not just with religious things, but political things, scientific things, uh, philosophical things. We have become a generation of, of men and women who look around us, and I think some of it's cynicism and disenfranchisement with all of the arguing and the fussing and the fighting and the negativity. Man, nobody wants to be a part of that all day, every day. And, and so we've narrowed down our own personal philosophy of life to the question of, well, does it make a difference for me? Does it matter to me? Because honestly, I'm pretty busy. And, and if it doesn't make a difference for me, I'm just not going to bother with it. Why should I care? Does the resurrection help me flourish as a human being? Does it help me achieve my goals in life? Does it benefit me personally as I live in this crazy, messed up, out of control world? And if it seems like it doesn't, then I'll look at the resurrection like I do, I don't know, string theory and alternate universes and UFOs and who shot JFK and 
Maybe the uh, latest self-help book from the latest self-help guru. The resurrection may be interesting to you. I just don't need to bother with it. If understanding it helps you, that's great. But don't press me on it. So my goal this morning isn't to talk to you about the resurrection in some esoteric, mysterious way that makes me look deeply religious and lets you check Easter off your attendance box for the year with us both going back to life as normal till Christmas rolls around in December. This morning I want to take a couple of minutes and talk about why the resurrection of Jesus should really matter to you. And not just what your heart or mind or emotions or even culture says should matter to you. So about 1,950 years ago, uh, the Apostle Paul preached a sermon at a place called Mars Hill, which was in Athens, Greece. Uh, Mars Hill was the philosophical center of the ancient Middle East and, and for all that was developed in the world at the time, probably the center of all worldly philosophical thought outside of China. Uh, the place where great philosophical debates would take place concerning the meaning of life and death, the existence of good and evil and the purpose of suffering and injustice in the world. And, and I could take those three things and tell you that the argument was yesterday and we would still be relevant. The sermon's taking place about 20 years after Jesus' death. It's found in Acts 17, and, and this is how Paul ends his sermon to the philosophers on Mars Hill. He says this, the times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man, Jesus, whom he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. Why should we repent? Because we'll be judged by God one day. How do we know we'll be judged? Because Jesus' resurrection from the dead is proof that God exists. As soon as Paul says this, the other philosophers, they cut him off. They begin to ridicule him. They begin to mock him. Because he claimed that Jesus was raised from the dead. Now this is important because it shows us that those in the ancient world were not a bunch of naive, gullible people who were easily duped with the thought that resurrections were normal. They were educated men. They were deep thinkers. But notice what Paul says. God calls the whole world to repent because we have all sinned against him. That is, we've not loved and treasured him above all else. The truth is, we were all idolaters before believing in Jesus because we worshipped and loved other things more than him, mainly ourselves. The need for repentance is urgent because God's going to judge the world in perfect righteousness. And he's going to do it by a man, Jesus Christ. Jesus will be the judge of every human one day. Me included and you included. Every human will stand before the living God-man Jesus None of our excuses will work, and all of us will be judged guilty unless we have trusted Christ as our Savior, and that we love Him more than anything in this world. The reason the resurrection of Jesus matters, because unlike UFOs and theories of alternate universes, what you believe about the resurrection of Jesus Christ will determine your eternal destiny. 
You can't just close your eyes and ignore whether or not he exists. Uh, Paul closes his sermon on Mars Hill with this statement. Of this, God has given assurance, evidence, proof to all by raising Jesus from the dead. And there it is. That's the reason why the resurrection should matter to you today. Whether you were a philosopher listening to Paul on Mars Hill 2,000 years ago, or here this morning at River's Edge, the resurrection of Jesus is designed by God to be absolute proof that repentance is necessary because one day you will stand before him and be judged. But we can't stop here because God's greatest desire is not that we fear him, but that we love him. There is a place for holy, reverent, awe-inspiring fear of God. But this is not it. Not in this passage and not on this Easter morning. This morning we're here because of what Scripture says in 1 John 4.10. This is real love. Not that we have loved God, but that He loved us. And sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. N.T. Wright said in his book, uh, The cross is the window to the very heart and character of the living and loving God. Why would the God of perfect justice allow something so unjust as the crucifixion to happen to his only son? The answer is in John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall have eternal life. Our sin deserves punishment and the only acceptable payment was death. So what did Jesus do? He paid the debt. The debt doesn't just automatically, magically vanish. Someone had to pay that debt. And that's what Jesus did. Romans 6.23 puts it this way, For the wages of sin is death. Do you realize that God has a balance sheet? And every time that you sin... And sin is simply anything I say, think, or do that doesn't honor God. So you know what? I'm at the front of that parade. I'm leading the charge. Because there's lots of days I either say, think, or do something that doesn't honor God. So, so when we think about the wages of sin in God's accounting book, man, every time I do something that doesn't please God, man, it goes on the ledger. Man, there's Gerald's wage of sin and it's death. But praise God, Romans 6, 23 doesn't stop there. It says, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. I, I think one of the greatest struggles that we face as human beings is by nature, we have a really hard time accepting free things from other people, Right? I had to learn a long time ago that before I could learn to be a giver, I had to learn to be a receiver. And that wisdom didn't just come to me. There was a gentleman uh, years ago when I first started ministry who, who every once in a while would walk up to me and just give me a $20 bill. Now, $20 was, you know, back in the late 90s, was like $50 today. And I would say, Mr. Herman, I don't need that. Mr. Herman, I know, please, Mr. Herman, I, you know, and he would say, you can't learn to give until you learn to receive. You can't learn to give until you learn to receive. Because you know what? Receiving takes a humility. It, it takes a setting aside of our pride. It takes this, this humbling of ourselves in that moment to graciously simply say, thank you. 
if I was to come to your house this afternoon, and, and I don't know, I don't drive fancy cars, but let me just make something up. Because I'm sure, well, I mean, now it could be, you know, a, a two-wheel drive stick shift pickup truck would be $80,000, right? But let, let's just say I, I pulled up to your house in a Bentley or something. That's, that, that's, that's an expensive car, right? And let's say it was one of the top of the lines, maybe two hundred fifty or $300,000, and I say, you know what, I was thinking about you the other day, and, and, and I just want you to have this car. I, I love you, and I appreciate you, and, and you mean a lot to me and my family, and I want to bless you with this brand new car. And I go to hand you the keys, and you say, oh, thank you, Pastor, so much. And then you reach in your wallet, and you hand me a $10 bill. It is a good deal. What happens in that moment, right? Number one, it's not a gift anymore because you've tried to pay me for it. But the problem is you've dishonored me and disrespected me by giving me $10 for a $250,000 car and calling it even. You've rejected my gift because you've tried to earn it with a $10 bill. Do you know how that's how it is with salvation? That's how it is with the grace of God. So many of us think that, that God gives us this free gift of salvation, but I've got to earn it. I've got to be a good person. I've got to do good things. God's going to hold it over my head. So, so here, God, I tell you what, I'll accept this gift of salvation through Jesus, and then I'll try to be a really, really good person and do really, really good things and, and make you proud of me and earn it. That's who we are as humans. But salvation's not about trying to give God $10 for an eternal life. Salvation is humbling ourselves and saying, I know I don't deserve this. I know I'm not worthy of it. But God, thank you. I receive it in humility. And I am forever indebted. Now, God doesn't hold it over our head. But if I gave you a $250,000 Bentley and you knew in my heart of hearts it was genuinely a gift and not a manipulation, every time you saw me, you would probably give me a hug, right? <laughs> Just because you knew I loved you and I want to bless you and honor you. And, and that's how it is with the Father. When, when we truly receive the gift that He offers us, it causes us to love him and want to honor him with our lives, not out of obligation and duty, but out of gratitude. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. Why would Jesus endure that suffering, agonizing death on the cross? Jesus endured the cross out of love. Out of love, the God of justice allowed his son to suffer unfathomable injustice so that he might justify us. Romans 5.1 says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through Jesus Christ our Lord. And I learned years and years and years and years ago in youth group that that word justified could be broken up and be just as if I'd never sinned. When we're justified by God, it is just as if I'd never sinned. And when I received that promise by faith, the peace of God comes into my life. Our question as we close this morning is simply this. Am I willing to allow the truth of the resurrection, God's ultimate show of love, move me to a place of accepting Christ as my Savior? That is the eternal question for every one of us this morning. That's what the resurrection is about. Am I willing to allow God to love me enough to receive the gift of Christ that I might live forever? Uh, this morning, if you're here today and you're not a follower of Jesus, we're going to have a, a prayer on the screen here in just a second. And, and what we do at River's Edge is 
is we all say this together because we never want to embarrass anybody or isolate them or make them feel like they're being pulled out of the crowd. But it's very, very important. It, it's, it's eternally important that if you've never asked Christ to be your Lord and Savior to just to justify you, uh, that you do that today before you leave because you may not have another opportunity. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. Don't harden your hearts against the Lord, but yield them to Him. And if you say this prayer this morning and, and you've accepted Christ into your heart, I personally want to follow up with you. I want to be able to pray for you. I want to be able to encourage you. I want to, I'm not going to badger you and harass you. I'm a text message guy, right? So technically you could block me if you don't like it. Um, but, but I want to send you a message. I want to encourage you. I want to let you know about some opportunities we here at, have at River's Edge to help you grow as a disciple in Jesus. And, and can I just tell you something? When you accept Christ as your Savior, you can't walk that road alone. Man, the enemy will be out to destroy you because he can stop you on the front end. He doesn't have to worry about you on the back end, right? And, and so you need somebody to walk alongside of you. And, and really, that's my thing. I love going one-on-one -on -one with people. If you're a lady, I'm not going one-on-one -on -one with you, but I got some great ladies in the church who will, okay? Um, but I love taking guys in, out to dinner or out to lunch or going fishing with them or encouraging them and, and helping them in their journey of faith. And, and we've got a tremendous team of godly older women who also do that for young women who believe or new believers who are women. So let's say this prayer together. And if you're saying this prayer today and you genuinely mean it as a receiving of Christ as your Savior, there's a card in the back of the pew in front of you. It's called a decision card. Just put your name and phone number on that for me so I can follow up with you this week. There's a wooden box on that back table back there that you can just drop it in. I'm the only person who sees it, okay? Uh, somebody will open it up. They'll take those cards out. They'll hand them directly to me. You don't have to worry about your name getting out there or whatever. Um, you know, because this isn't about number one trying to bring you to the altar and make me look like a great preacher or something. Number two, it's not about you being embarrassed. Number three, it is about you coming into relationship with Christ and then being able to be loved and encouraged in your faith, okay? So let's say this prayer together. Heavenly Father, forgive me of my sins. Make me brand new. I believe you died and are risen so I could be forgiven, so I could serve you. Fill me with your spirit so I can follow you for the rest of my life. Today I give you my life in Jesus' name, amen. A couple of quick announcements. Maybe you're already a follower of Jesus, or maybe you're just not quite ready to take that step yet. Uh, fill out an information card, and uh, if you've got questions or concerns or want something to, you want to communicate with me, um, that's a great way to do that as well. I'm always willing to follow up and, and help you in your spiritual journey. Um, April 21st, well, this Wednesday... We're feeding a mission team that's coming in from Kentucky, doing some work in our area. And so um, we've got some, some people working on that. If, if you're part of that team and you have any questions of what the plans are, if you'll get with, um, let me pick somebody who's on the team, Carol Wallets at the back wall. Um, that's what happens when you sit when I can see you. Um, so she'll help you get the details on that. April 21st is our 10-year anniversary as a church. Woohoo! We made it 10 years. And uh, there were moments we all wondered, weren't there? But, uh, but God has blessed us. And, and today just is an example of the, the abundant grace and mercy of God, His pleasure uh, in our seeking Him. Uh, so I encourage you to come. We're going to have dinner on the grounds. We've got a little gift for everybody who shows up. Uh, we got a guest speaker coming in. Um, Pastor Allen from Anchor Church. I was waiting and waiting and waiting on confirmation that he was going to be able to speak. You will love him. And uh, we'll do some presentations and some different things that day. It's going to be a, just a day of fellowship and food and celebration. Then on the 24th, we are feeding the teachers at the elementary school lunch. And then one of the first three weekends of May, we're going to go down to the elementary school. They're putting in a sensory walkway, and they've asked us to come paint for them. They've got the stencils and the paints and all of that kind of stuff, so we'll be doing that. Uh, the 28th, um, our missionary from Central Asia will be in to speak to us. 
because of the work that he does and where he does it in the world, we will not be broadcasting that Sunday morning. Um, we're not going to show him publicly on the internet. It would endanger his life and that of his family. But he'll be on here on the 28th to speak to us. And lots and lots and lots of other new cool things. We're doing homeless outreach third Saturday of April. Okay. And uh, just look at your bulletin. We've got lots going on here. Um, but anyway, hey, look, I love you guys. And I mean that. I genuinely mean that. I love you. Whether I've known you for 10 years or whether we're meeting for the first time today, I love you because God loves you. And if there's anything in the world I can do to help you out, anything in the world I can do to help you out, you know I'm here for you. Uh, let's stand. I know you didn't plan a comeback song. Can we do Holy Spirit as our closing song? All right. So we're going to do Holy Spirit as we leave. And that will be a great way to exit our Easter. God bless you. I love you. And we'll see you next Sunday. beautiful day. Amen. There's nothing worth more that will ever come close. No thing can compare you're our living hope. Your presence, Lord. And I tasted and seen all the sweetest of loves when my heart becomes free and my shame is undone. Your presence, Lord. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come flood this place, fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for, to be
Resurrection Sunday. Be blessed in Jesus' name. 